All right. Welcome to another episode of For Footballers Only. I'm Mike. I'm James Pinay. And today we have a special guest. Hi, everybody. My name is Kaya McCullough. Um, I'm super excited to be here. Nice, nice. All right, Kai, let's just get right into it. Where does your football story begin? Um, in sunny California. I, I really started playing when I was, I think, four or five, which is, I feel like, very typical for a lot of people, at least where I'm from. Southern California is like a hotbed of soccer activity in the U.S. game. Um, so it kind of seems only natural that I played. I came from a family of athletes. Um, my dad played football at UCLA, and my mom was a gymnast there. So they kind of met and fell in love and had me, and so it was only natural that I was going to end up picking some sport, and it just so happened to be soccer. Um, but from there, you know, I started playing just rec, and it became pretty apparent really quickly that I was pretty good at it. So from a really early age, I was playing – the year above me um, because it was a little bit too easy with people my own age. And then I eventually, oh, sorry. I eventually started um, playing like the select team for rec. Mm -hmm. And then I got recruited by a club because again, I just kept kind of advancing really, really quickly. And from there, you know, I kind of just went through the club structure and made my way all the way up to play for UCLA um, with some twists and turns in between that long period. Um, but then after my four-year career at UCLA, I got drafted to go play in the NWSL. Um, didn't wasn't the right fit for me. So then I ended up going to Germany to play in the second Bundesliga. And again, it wasn't really the right fit for me. So now I'm home kind of resetting and refiguring out my path and what's next for me. Um, and yeah, now I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. All right. I mean, yeah, yeah th there's a lot there. Um, and we will go into all of those components, especially, you know, the Bundesliga, um, uh, the league here, et cetera, and the UCLA. But before we even get there, let's go back to Orange County. You're, you know, you start playing and then you get bumped up. You're playing a year up, like even in rec. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> and then you go into the club structure. In the well, when given that your mom was a gymnast and your dad played American football, how did you end up like how did they put you into soccer? I don't know. I mean, I had tried gymnastics and like dance, and I just wasn't very good good at it. Um, in terms of like from a really early age, I wasn't very flexible, mm -hmm. so my mom couldn't really bear to watch me do gymnastics, to be honest. Um, but I don't know. That's just, I feel like in, in Orange County and in, you know, Southern California, ask most kids and they'll play soccer when they're a kid. Um, it's just kind of what you do. It's like one of the first sports you can play really young, um, because it doesn't take all that much equipment and, you know, when you're just playing rec, it doesn't take all that much skill. So, I don't know. I just kind of stuck and I never really wanted to explore another sport. Right now, my younger brother is nine and I think he's doing three sports right now. He's doing baseball, football, basketball, but I just never really felt the desire to play another sport once I connected with soccer. <laughs> yeah. The question, no, so who was your first coach? Was it your mom or your dad? Like your first ever coach? Neither. Right. They didn't know soccer really when I started. Um, mm -hmm. So it was like somebody on my, my rec team's parent. <laughs> I don't even remember who, but okay. no, one thing I was always adamant about growing up was that my parents like didn't coach me. <laughs> um, I feel like that wouldn't, would have, you know, violated some boundaries for me as a kid. So mm -hmm. neither of them have ever coached me. Wow. <laughs> Wow. Okay. All right. So when you, you know, especially you, you, you know, you're transitioning from rec to a club, did you have any football idols? I mean, this is hard because I, there's a lot about my childhood I don't remember for a lot of other reasons, but um, no, like I didn't really grow up 
really watching soccer. I know I had nobody in my family who had ever really played soccer. I think my dad might have played when he was a kid, but like, and my mom maybe played rec when she was young, but like, we weren't a soccer family. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have any idols. I kind of was just like going into it blind and it was just a sport I really liked to play. So when I was a kid, no, I, I had no soccer idols. I just was playing, just learning and wow. figuring out how to do it. <laughs> and and that continued until when? Like when when did you start watching a game and you know? Um, I don't know, like I, I didn't, again, I didn't really watch soccer growing up. And I think that speaks a lot to how, like, the culture for soccer is here in America. Mm -hmm. um, very other sport focus. And there wasn't, like, a league like there is now. So I could watch women who were playing soccer, yeah. um, at least that I can remember at the time. Uh, so, I mean, it really wasn't until I kind of latched on to, like, our national teams that I started watching soccer. I remember... Um, the earliest was maybe like one of the world cups. I, I remember being maybe like the South Africa or yeah, the South Africa world cup, maybe mm -hmm. it was like the earliest I can remember like being super into watching soccer. Mm -hmm. Um, and then obviously like watching the women's team is really awesome. Um, so I don't have a date. <laughs> I don't have an age. I don't really remember. Um, but it wasn't. It wasn't until, like, I started watching, like, World Cups where I was like, oh, this is a lot bigger than I thought it was. Because, <laughs> again, like, I kind of existed and grew up in this bubble yeah. um, <laughs> where I thought everything kind of revolved around me and the place I lived. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. So, no, no, that's fine. Uh, and, and that's so interesting. I mean, this is kind of what we were talking about before, you know, we started to record it, you know, the lack of um, – even for folks who play the game and, you know, who are active in it, it's still, you know, in a like the other activity, right? The the culture of the game is is a big piece that's still missing uh, in the game. But um, going back to, you know, so you, you start watching World Cup in South Africa and then, you know, picking on to the Women's World Cup. So then when you started, did you start uh, following players and developing your, your sense of who's your favorite player and et cetera? Again, like not really on the international stage. No, I didn't start following them like with their respective clubs. Um, it's just not, <laughs> I, I guess it's better now. Like I know a lot of kids and a lot of people who follow soccer now especially like international soccer where they buy all the channels and they buy all this stuff yeah. um but for me i you know i never got super into like any one team i kind of just really enjoyed watching the competition for myself and i think that's pretty unique for like a soccer player just because i i liked playing i didn't like watching as much yeah. as i i know a lot of other people do Okay, so do you have? Uh, so I'm going to ask you this question anyway, and 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 you may, given now that you've, you know, you transitioned to another level in the game. The question is, and there's there's really no right or wrong answer. And for folks who really know the game and watch the game and study the game and play the game, etc., regardless of what you say, they're going to have issues with what you say. So I just want you to know, I just want you to know that, right? So, um, so the question is, who's in your top 11 footballers of all time? I, I don't, I don't have an answer for you for this. <laughs> I, again, I'm sorry. I'm not going to answer that. Players Like American players. You have uh, top 11 American players at least. I don't like men. I couldn't even name ten American men. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. That, that actually, so yeah, just for clarity, yeah. this is not. Yeah, it's not about men's football. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, no, no. yeah. It's it's and you know I'll give you some examples. Some folks, like some coaches, for instance, have named uh, players that they coach that never really, you know, transitioned to uh, college or pro, for instance, but where they felt like this person had extreme gifts both as a player and as a leader or, um, you know, some folks, some players were activists, et cetera. So it's all, you know, 
like and that's and that's the point the point is like it's your you know it's your idea on for whatever reason these players resonate with you and so i guess that's a different perspective i i really enjoyed my team um over the years at ucla and there are a few players who are still my close friends who i think impacted me greatly um and I've had I've had teammates throughout the years again who have had kind of the same effect, um, but I mean, do you want me to, to name them? Yeah, yeah, and 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 I'll and I'll I'll, I'll go through. You know, when you say one, two, three, we'll go through eleven. Um. Okay. Uh, one is one of my best friends in the world, Tegan Micah. She plays for Australia. She's a goalkeeper. Um, Jesse Fleming, amazing player, plays for Chelsea. Um, Tegan McGrady plays for Washington Spirit. She's an incredible person and player. Um, love, love, love playing with Ashley Sanchez. Super dynamic. Um, always was on the receiving end of like my giant through balls. Um, Loved playing with Haley Mace, who plays for the Courage, just absolute like athlete, and was a pleasure to play with the in the defense with um, Karina Rodriguez. I played with or next to for three years during my time at UCLA. We went to two cho- college cups. Literally, like one of those relationships where you don't even have to really talk to know what each other are gonna do. How many am I at? Six, six. Yeah, four, five more. <laughs> um, Andy Sullivan is an incredible, incredible leader. Probably one of the best leaders I've ever played under. Um, I wish you guys would have prepped me with this. I would have, I would have, I would have came with a list because <laughs> it's hard thinking on the spot. Um. That's all I have for you for right now. Seven. So you have a top. You always go back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Of course, I want to. Sorry. Ask. Like, sorry. I. I. Again, I wish you guys would have prepped me with that. I would. Oh, okay. I would have no, came with a list. Yeah, no, 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 no. That's fine. I mean, trust me. Like, uh, even there's, there's folks we, we like we do this once, right? Like, so let's just say we we do this interview now. We ask you that question, and then three months later. We ask you the question again. <laughs> it's still like, yeah, it's, it's still is like, especially for, like if you re- like really have like a lot of players in mind. Um, is it that's part of it? Is extremely difficult to narrow down to your top eleven, um, especially when you say you know your top eleven of all time. But it, it's whatever your top eleven is. It says a lot about you. For some folks, it says you know, um, you know, I'm very into the Spanish game or like uh, you know. Bundesliga, whatever it is, um, or even the college game. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I'm, I guess in that regard, a bad soccer player because I genuinely don't watch it as much as I should. Yeah. But I just never have. And so it's not like something that <laughs> – I don't know. I watch pretty actively the NWSL right now. Um, but, yeah, I, I've just always been <laughs> more interested in the playing aspect of it. I love yeah. being in the field. <laughs> Um, obviously like <laughs> that, I don't want to make it sound like I don't like watching soccer cause I definitely do. Um, but I never was got into it. I just didn't have people around me who watched a ton of soccer. Yeah. Um, so. No, no, I, no, like, and it, you're not, you're, it's not, um, like, tr- trust me, it's not people, a unique, a of, yeah, 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 yeah. There, there's a lot of, there's a lot of folks and and a big part of it is the culture. Like so, you know, if you go to other cultures, for instance, it's you know when there's a game on, you know, even if it's in um, whatever neighborhood, like everyone gather around. You know, there, there there might be a store, and then the game is being played outside, and everybody just gather around there, and then maybe drinking beers or coke or whatever it is, and just you know, it, it's a social thing, right? Yeah. Um, and so, but here, you know. Folks do the same with American football, for instance, yeah. you know, like with the tailgating, you know, like, so there's the cultural component um, for, you know, American football, uh, even, you know, basketball that's not here for, uh, you know, for football. Um, so, and you I, know, it, go on. 
I also feel like, you know, like you said, just going off the culture thing, like the leagues that are in Europe are just so, so good. And in South America, like they're just so good. Yeah. And like here, like if the MLS was more entertaining, like that would be something that maybe <laughs> I would like consider watching regularly. But you know what I mean? Like, no, 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 I, hear you. So, I mean, that, that's, that's something we, we can, we can get into that now. Uh, uh, you know, your point about the MLS, right? So, um, what do you so, think? So before we get into it, I just wanted okay. to ask, right? Because you, you referenced like a tool ball. What position did you play? How you currently play? Or did you play in college? I played uh, for the first part of my life. I played forward, just like a nine okay. or a, maybe a seven. I don't know. Kind of just depend, depended on the, the day. But the second half of my career, I play center back or I played center back. Yeah. So. Oh, wow. That oh, classic, yeah. I know that that's an interesting that's transition. Yeah, was was it because you got uh, like just bigger? Uh, you know, I was just fast, um, and they needed somebody fast to be able to catch fast forwards. So it kind of was like this random transition. One time we were playing in a in a tournament, and we got scored on in like the first. 30 seconds of the game and my coach was like go to the back and I was like what I've never played defense in my entire life um and then I just never left <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so wow that's yeah. it happens yeah, definitely yeah, yeah I mean but that, that for like from a nine to a center back I usually like, it would be even like a winger or I yeah. mean they're pretty interchangeable positions, if you ask me. Like, a nine and a center back have very similar skill sets. Uh, just, you know, the stature, the speed is, like, pretty similar. Like, they're almost kind of the antithesis of one another. Like, I felt I was a really good center back because I kind of knew how nines thought. Uh -huh. um, but I think they're very interchangeable and so it really was like obviously i had to learn like about you know stepping people off sides and <laughs> all that stuff like i had to learn the little nuances of defending and formations and you know being pretty much the person who sets play mm -hmm. so that stuff came with time but i think the skills are pretty interchangeable like what you need to be a, a really successful nine will make you a really successful center back and vice versa <laughs> especially like you say you had a, the pace the speed that can really help as well playing those both uh this possession yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah um all right i mean we we could get into that another time i was but, gonna but ask you this huh no 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 oh. yeah, i know i, I want to get to the mls but i want to ask you especially when when did you when you were younger when did you know that you know this is Football is my game, and I'm going to really focus in on this and continue, um, you know, playing this game. I was this from the start? Eight, six, I don't know. Like, when I was a kid, like, again, I did not want to do anything else. <laughs> I had no desire to play any other sport, um, and I kind of just stuck with it. And, uh, I mean, again, like I said, it was pretty obvious I was, I was really good at it. And I liked, you know, being really good at something. And so I kind of just ran with it. And I mean, I guess in terms of like when I knew that I could go to college and potentially like get my schooling paid for, I was probably like 12. So, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was really serious for me from a really young age. I wasn't really sure like, you know, what level I could aspire to. Obviously everybody has like the dream of being on the national team, but like that's a pretty out there goal. And at the time there wasn't a very visible women's league in the U S so I wasn't really sure, you know, how far I could take it, but I knew that I at least wanted to ride it out um, until college. Yeah. All right. Um, we'll come back to, but you, you brought up something about the MLS. Um and, you know, what you said was the MLS is not, uh, you know, maybe if it was more entertaining or. I'm going to get heat for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I, you know, just like, so walk us through your, your thought pattern. Um, or what do you think, what do you think the issue is with the, you know, the level of play in the MLS? 
I, I don't – and again, like, I think the men's game and the women's game are kind of different um, for a lot of reasons. But I don't know. If, if I had the choice between watching, like, Champions League and then watching the MLS, like, what am I going to pick? Obviously, Champions League. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, it's not that it's not – it's not that it's not like good soccer and it is entertaining, I guess, in the fact that like, I don't know, there's more mistakes. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I just, I personally, I think that there's better quality soccer to be consumed for men, Yeah. Um, for men playing, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so if I was going to watch a men's game, like I would, watch some, a game in Europe, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I will say, like, I like the atmosphere at MLS games. The supporter groups are all really awesome, and, like, the environment is really cool. Um, but, again, that's, like, more of an in-person thing, you know what I mean? Yeah. <sighs> Sorry so, for anybody I'm offending. No, no, no. no, 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 no it's okay. I think yeah, I mean, that's part of it. Um, but, so, are you uh, comparing, comparing the U.S. Women's League to say the European Women's League, what would you say? Do, do, do you think that's more comparable um, or the U.S. is more fun or entertaining? There's more talent here. Uh, I, I think it's more compare. Like, I think the European leagues for women and um, the American League, I think they're, they're closer. You know what I mean? They're more interchangeable. Like, players go back and forth all the time from NWSL to – you know, the women's leagues in Europe, all across Europe and vice versa. So I think there's definitely (laughs) uh, an element that is more interchangeable with that. And like, I mean, you just even look at for the men's game, you look at like the salary differences, like, I mean, the, the qualities in like the product, you know what I mean? If we're looking at it from like a monetary perspective, like it's just stupid amounts of money being spent on soccer in Europe or football in Europe. Um, so yeah, I definitely think the women's game is a little bit more even across the board um, from country to country, less so for the men. <laughs> yeah. Um, so given that you played at, you know, after club, you went to the world famous, uh, especially for women's football, UCLA, for, I mean, for a lot of sports, but uh, women's football uh, as well. Um, one, do you, the level of competition and the, the skill level on your team at UCLA, how was that comparable to when you transitioned to the pro league, so with, you know, uh, Spirits or Bundesliga? Well, I think anytime, like, you go up a level, um, it's going to be a little bit faster. But I think, you know, UCLA, we were playing one of the top, if not the top level of soccer, like, in the entire country. And so I think it was a really good um, stepping stone to be able to play pro. Um, Obviously, like, my career in the NWSL wasn't very long lived, but I think my time at UCLA prepped me pretty well for what I was going into. And I had, you know, played a lot of the people that I was teammates with and slash playing against in the NWSL while I was a UCLA Bruin. So I don't know. I think it translated pretty nicely. And I mean, that's how it kind of is for the women's game. Like everybody at the top level has been playing against each other with or against uh for years <laughs> at that point um because that's just kind of how the college structure works mm. and that's a little bit different for men like none of the best players go to college yeah. so that's a good point by the way <laughs> yeah it's so, uh, a question right so maybe some of them might be a young lady listening tonight or uh, when we post it up how many teams is on the uh the the the, uh, the women's league here in the u.s and when, when does the season start? It's already – their preseason is starting right now. Mm-hmm. Um, the Challenge Cup is going on. So, super awesome to see. I think there's – I want to say there's nine teams right now. Mm-hmm. It could be ten. But they are adding um, another team next year. And they're constantly expanding, which is super awesome because that means more spots, more roster spots available. That means, you know – 
more people who can participate in the league, um, more cities that can get involved in the culture of soccer. So, yeah, I think their their next expansion team is going to be in L.A., which is, you know, a great soccer capital, I think, in the U.S. Yeah. Um, they just had an expansion team this year in Louisville, okay. Kentucky, which, again, is, like, super great soccer culture. So, yeah, they're expanding, but uh, the season's starting now. If a young listener is, hey, it doesn't even have to be a girl. It can be anybody yeah. who is interested in soccer. Mm-hmm. It's really awesome. And, um, you know, supporting women in sports is always a good thing in my book. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Mm-hmm. Quick question. Are you, um, are you interested in uh, playing in the NWSL again? Uh, that's a tough question. I still ask myself every day. Um, obviously, like my experience was a little not great. So I think it would just really depend on like a variety of circumstances. But, you know, a lot of what I'm doing now is is working outside of that space. Um, so I don't know. It's It's something I go back and forth on. But I don't know. I, I knew... I knew from a young age, like, soccer has never been everything for me. I have always really loved learning. I've loved school. And I've had a lot of passions throughout my life. So it never was just, like, fully soccer focused. And so, you know, part of the question is, like, when do I, you know, when do I stop one dream and then pursue another? You know what I mean? So, I mean, that, those are just questions that I'm, I'm asking myself and working through them. It was a really traumatic year for everybody last year. And I think for me, I'm just kind of taking the space right now to recharge my mental health and get on a good, on a, get in a good space again so I can make clear and rational decisions about my future. Yeah. Uh, so two questions about that. One, are you still uh, training, like fo- doing football training? And then two, um, where you know you you brought up what you're currently focused on now. Uh, it's not necessarily in the football space. And and so, what are you currently focused on now? Um, I just started going to the gym again, which is really awesome with all the COVID restrictions. So it's been nice feeling strong again. Um, In terms of soccer, I'm not training with, like, a team or anything. I've considered playing for some, um, like, semi-pro teams, but I don't know if I'll end up doing that just because, again, like, I'm I'm working on a lot. But outside the soccer space, I am studying for my LSAT. I plan to go to law school, so working really hard with that and working on just some passion projects. Obviously, we launched Anti-Racist Soccer Club, which does exist in the soccer space, but just kind of um, not not in it, mm-hmm. <laughs> not playing in it necessarily. Um, and then, you know, some other passion projects that I have, but I don't know. I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of pivoting and seeing where it takes me. And um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm focused on that right now. Yeah. So uh, you brought up anti-racist soccer club. Is this um, like, in the football sense like is it a like a playing club or is it you know something else like an organization no it's an organization to help end racism in american soccer wow um so what what are some of the initiatives uh that you guys are working on well, I mean, it's very new and it's it's just launched. Essentially, what we plan for it to be and hope for it to be is a framework through which teams, supporter groups, um, organizations, clubs can, you know, pledge this 10-point plan that we collaborated on for things that would help end racism or work towards ending racism in soccer. And so you know, hopefully teams would be able to, it's a coalition. And so, you know, it would be all these groups of people, these supporter groups, these organizations, these clubs, all collaborating and working together and, you know, saying we're committed to X, Y, Z. For example, like 
you know, supporting black owned businesses in their local area, et cetera, et cetera. It's a 10 point plan. Um, so, you know, we hope that it just helps create a bit of accountability and really gets teams kind of off their asses and organizations off their asses from being super performative with a lot of the anti-racist stuff that they're doing and then actually, you know, creating initiatives and tangible changes that, you know, will actually impact the soccer space. Uh, so how, how can like uh, local organization or local businesses or even local club join the, uh, the organization? Is it yeah, it's still, it's still very new and we're still, you know, working out some kinks. Um, but essentially teams would just sign up and we have, and they would submit their 10 point plan. We're working on, you know, finding other partnerships and stuff to make this bit a little bit easier, but we have like a, a committee of people who you know can who go through and review the plan and you know say hey we think this we think that um and we plan to execute and again we're still you know (laughs) figuring out the kinks with this uh we plan to do like a quarterly review process for all the people in the coalition just to make sure that that you know they're kind of meeting these benchmarks that they're setting for themselves as again just like a way to promote accountability in the soccer space. Yeah. And um, I know you said, you said uh, teams, but to, to James point, uh, well, are you guys thinking of um, having this coalition uh, also have local, like, you know, youth clubs or rec clubs, et cetera? Absolutely. Like supporter groups, organizations. And by that, I meant like clubs, Mm -hmm. um, teams professional teams semi-pro teams um yeah i mean ideally idealistically we want this to be to touch every space um in soccer in america and that'll probably take some time but um that's the that's the vision yeah uh okay as so my initial question to this is for you what was the genesis um you know, what moved you to start this organization? And then two, um, you know, as a, you know, a black soccer player, um, and you played on all levels, right, from rec to pro, did you experience racism? And if you did, uh, were there any... Did you have any opportunities to like remedy the situation? Um, In terms of what kind of inspired me to, you know, help work with anti-racist soccer club is just, you know, I see that there's a need for it. I think soccer is inherently racist in America. Um, The way that it functions, the way that, you know, you have to, the path that you have to take if you want to get somewhere with it and be successful um is racist and it's classist so you know i think it was just more addressing a need that was there and in terms of have i experienced racism i mean not not nearly as much as i'm sure other people have um but you know i i have had some (laughs) some instances and i was not able to remedy them them and um I guess that's kind of why I'm functioning in this space now is because I don't want people to feel as vulnerable as I did and as out of control as I did um, and not really have the tools or the resources to, to get help. Um, So yeah, that's kind of what is, I guess, inspiring the work that I'm doing now. So just, uh, Going a little deeper on, you know, you mentioned that uh, the game is inherently racist in the U.S., like the structure and, you know, what, what needs to happen. Can you go a little deeper into that? So for folks who may not um, truly understand what that, you know, where you're getting at. Well, I just mean, you know, ultimately the clubs that exist here at like the pro level, um, even at the youth level, like they exist to make money. 
they can try and frame it however way that they want to like promote the beautiful game, whatever, like they exist to make money and to make money, you know, you need people to be developed and you need people to pay. And, um, the way that soccer works in America is like the pay to play structure. Um, so, you know, rec is decently cheap. I think it's like a hundred dollar, uh, registration fee and, you know, you, buy the equipment and you're good to go. You just play. But if you want to have any shot at, you know, potentially going to college or going pro, then you got to play club. I don't really know of any instances of people who have been, at least on the woman's side, like I don't know of any instances of people who like haven't played for some club who have made it all the way to the top. Um, so, you know, like just the the sheer amount of money and time and like sacrifice that it that it takes to get to the top level um quite frankly is racist because you know not everybody has the resources to be able to do that and you know i bet that we are skipping over oh no not not i bet i know we are skipping over some tremendous talent just because they simply don't have the resources to get to practice the money to be able to play club due to pay club dues they don't have the access to be able to go you know to showcases to get shown off um to college coaches in another state you know you have to pay for hotel food transportation um ref fees like there's just so many costs and i mean i i would be scared to look at how much my youth career cost my parents and i was thankfully able to afford it um just because you know luck like, I got born into the family in the place that I did. I, quite frankly, I was lucky. Um, so, you know, I think part of remedying that in the future would be eliminating that pay-for-play structure and, you know, finding ways that we can foster talent and, you know, get really serious about having kids play for, like, the love of the culture and the love of the game rather than just trying to make money off of them well said yes what was what was your most memorable moment as a player um probably uh my sophomore year of college at ucla again like i was raised a broom baby both my parents went there met there, fell in love there, had me, like, Bruin baby. Um, we were playing SC in uh, Drake Stadium, and it was completely sold out. I don't know if you know what Drake Stadium looks like, but it's, like, an Olympics track stadium. So there was, like, over 12,000 people there, and it was just crazy. Like, seeing, like – seeing Drake filled out completely was just like an unreal experience for me. And then I ended up scoring my first and only goal in college in that game. And it was just against SC in a packed stadium. Um, my friends and family there, we ended up winning in like double overtime. So it was just a really awesome game, but just being able to like dribble up and score in that game, I think was one of my more memorable moments being a player. That is nice. Um, and what was your most challenging or, you know, it doesn't have to be a moment, but what did you find to be the most challenging thing as a player? It could be youth or, you know, as you got older, college and pro. Um, probably just having like, or feeling like <laughs> my voice was being unheard. Um, I am very much a person that doesn't like to feel like what I have to say is being silenced in any way. Um, so I think there's just been instances in my career where I've, I've felt uncomfortable speaking up about things, um, whether that be, you know, having to do with soccer or, you know, social issues. Um, so that's probably been the most difficult part of my career is just finding that 
that balance of like wanting to be a good teammate um, and not wanting to really rock the boat too much and mess up team chemistry, but also staying true to myself and my beliefs Mm -hmm. and making sure that the things that I believe in, um, you know, are always coming through. Yeah. Yeah. What what, was some of the life lesson? Like if you can name three that you, you gained from soccer. I mean, I, I, (laughs) it's hard to separate myself and my life away from soccer, quite frankly, because I've been a soccer player my whole life, Mm -hmm. save for the first like five years, maybe. Um, So, you know, almost every single life lesson that I have learned has kind of had to do with soccer in one way or another, but um, I don't know, just, I think soccer really gave me a confidence in myself that I, I might not have had otherwise. I think it taught me to trust myself and my instincts and, um, you know, to just believe in myself no matter the circumstance. I know soccer is a team sport, but you know, it relies on individuals and I think it relies on individuals like having the confidence and the skill to be able to execute a team plan. So I think that's probably one of the biggest things I've learned is just being able to trust myself. Yeah. Going back to your, you know, the challenge um, you find in your voice, um, how have you, you know, how have you been able to navigate that and, and find your voice and be able to speak up for yourself and advocate, uh, et cetera. And then just to piggyback on that, any, any guidance you can provide, you know, like a young player who um, may have that same experience, especially, um, no, anyway, I, this is this is true for, it, it could be true for everyone, but I, I, I think it, it may particularly for, you know, players of color, black players, et cetera, in the U.S., um, you know, going back to what you originally talked about with, you know, racism in the game, um, how any guidance you can provide would be useful. Yeah, I mean, I guess this kind of answers both questions, but, you know, there are going to be people who want to silence you and there are going to be people who kind of just want you to go along with the status quo. Um, But the status quo isn't, you know, a safe place for players of color, people of color in soccer. So, you know, part of my evolution as a player, as a person has been, again, kind of walking that tightrope of being able to be a good teammate, but also, you know, standing true and standing firm in my beliefs. And part of that was being able to just find my voice. Um, And again, like I said, there are times where people are going to want to silence it, but I think it's just important to know that what you say is valid and what you feel is valid. Um, And again, like, I think what I just said, like, just finding that confidence in yourself, that belief in yourself is something that goes such a long way. And I think soccer is a really awesome way to find that Um, because your voice matters and what you have to say matters. So I don't know for any young player of color, like I just encourage you to stick with it and just know that there are a ton of people who have come before you and there are a ton of people who will come after you who are in the exact same fight as you are, who have been in the exact same position as you are or who will be. And just know that, you know, you being a a footballer is revolutionary in and of itself. And um, again, like your voice is really powerful. And the more that you use it and the more you kind of get steady with it, the more confidence you get over time, the more powerful it'll be. So, yeah. Well said, well said. What would you want your ultimate contribution to the game to be? I mean, (laughs) super, super, super idealistically, like, I'd like to, you know, help just be like a a small, small component in, you know, creating a space that's more equitable for people of color and and for women. Um, I know that's really idealistic and I, I don't know if that'll be achieved in my lifetime. I hope it will be. Um, but 
you know, if, if I can even just be a small piece in that puzzle, I think that would, you know, define success for me in this space. Yeah. Well said, well said. Well, it's been a pleasure. Um, you know, I think uh, this is extremely informative for a lot of young players in particular. I think um, the piece about finding your voice and using your voice is something that's not discussed a lot, um, you know, when it comes to young athletes, you know, partially because we're focusing on the, you know, the, the, like the development, the talent, the, you know, the, the, the physical gifts um, as opposed to everything else. Uh, but, it, you know, it is important in developing a, a whole person. Um, so, yeah, yeah I, I think that would. And also, I, like, even with the, with the comments of what's happening in the country, you're talking about the racism in football. So it's very important that our audience can actually hear it. It's not only just what's happened, but it's also happening in football or soccer, you know? Yeah. And it's very important to know as well. So well, really I will say, like, my coaches have changed my life. Like, you guys are doing really important work. I, <laughs> I would not be the person, the player, the leader, the woman I am today without, like, really amazing coaches in my life. So... I appreciate you guys. You guys are doing the good work. Um, only through good mentors do people end up like me. So <laughs> nice, nice. Yes. Actually, um, you bring up something. Are you? Is this like anywhere in your mind? Considering, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know what I'm gonna say, right? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've always said I like hate coaching. I used to coach like little rec <laughs> players. Um, it's just a lot like I just and I say that because I was just a really intense kid uh -huh. and so when kids don't match that intensity and focus it like <laughs> drives me nuts <laughs> um I don't know I've thought about getting my coaching license just to like have it in my back pocket um uh -huh. I would have liked having a coach like me <laughs> so <laughs> I don't know maybe maybe in the future yeah uh, uh, no I mean we need you know we need more um we need more dynamic coaches, right? And we need, uh, I mean, e even, you know, like the piece of you being, you know, someone with the talent, the physical gifts, you know, you have this experience, et cetera, but you have that additional piece, right? Which is the, you know, the advocacy work. Um, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a huge, I think it's important to see, you know, the symbolism is, is important for kids and, you know, young players coming up, so. Mm -hmm. Keep it in mind. Keep it in mind. I, I know. I, I know. I know. You know. You, you have a lot of things. You know, passion projects on your plate. Um, but this, you know, this could be an extremely beneficial yeah. passion yeah. project uh, for future I'll, generations. I'll consider it a little bit more after this. <laughs> good. 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 Well. <laughs> No, I mean it's been a pleasure. Um, mm -hmm. You know, thanks a lot for joining us. How can uh, how can folks get in touch with you? I mean, I, actually, you know, because you have a lot a, a number of things going on, um, and so please definitely provide the information for the the anti racist uh, club as well. But yeah, how can folks get in touch with you? Um, yeah, follow you know anti racist soccer club on socials. I'll give you guys this the actual ads so you can like post it because I don't have them right now. Um, mm -hmm. My personal socials, I'm pretty active on Twitter, Hayakaya. Um, and then I also have a podcast if you guys want to listen more about <laughs> my life mm -hmm. um, called Unfiltered with Kaya McCullough. So that's on social at Unfiltered WKM. Um, but yeah, no, I'm, I'm kind of everywhere. It's, it's really not hard to get in touch with me. I, I check my DMs pretty frequently. So um, yeah, would love to, you know, connect with more people. Um, who need mentorship at all. <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Yeah, you know, whenever, uh, if you ever make, make your way down on uh, the East Coast, um, you know, you say you like playing, so uh, we have a bunch of ballers on, on this side, so we can, <laughs> we can definitely get a pickup game going and you yes. know, get busy. That'd uh, be fun. Although it is a little bit humid in the, in the <laughs> East Coast for me, so... <laughs> Wow. I, mean, I know you, that, yeah, you're right. That's that Southern Cal, like she, yeah. you know, everything is perfect over there. So you know, it's it's it's, uh... it's hard to leave. 
Oh man, but yeah, no, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for having me. No worries. Have a good one. Thanks. Later. Mm -hmm. Bye.